Greetings one and all, I'm Strategic Sage, and today the curtain has been lifted on Nine's Little Abyss, the third and final expansion for AI War 2. Full disclosure, this is not a sponsored video. I did receive a free copy of the expansion from Arkham Games, but that was more due to me being a tester and providing feedback. The headline feature in Nine's Little Abyss is the ability to play as a necromancer empire, really a completely different experience a revolutionary new play style and we will be getting to that for the balance of this video but I wanted to go over the rest of the expansion in overview form first because it's massive it's the biggest in my opinion the best expansion out of the three so far so in addition to the necromancer player type there is an additional victory condition the showdown for those of you familiar with AI War Classic you'll know what this is it involves a brutal confrontation with the AI an explosive winner-take-all climax in which the AI literally sends everything it has in the galaxy at you at once. There are five additional factions that you can add to any game, which doesn't count a sixth that automatically comes for the ride in any Necromancer game. If my count is correct, with all three expansions you now have a total of 27 different factions that you can add to any game. So if you're a fan of strategy games and you can't find something in there that's interesting to you, I don't know what to tell you. There are eight additional AI types, most in the moderate to hard range, but there's also one that's brutal. There's an entirely new class of AI guardians known as Venators. There's ten different types, and they are designed to specifically counter players who are heavily focusing on one particular type of ship. So if you're going all in on melee ships, or low armor ships, or whatever it might be, then the AI can respond by putting a bunch more of its resources into a Venator that counters that playstyle. So it's more responsive to what you're doing. There are 13 new kinds of eye structures that the AI can build, so there's a much greater variety of those, multiple times over what there is presently in the game. We've previously discussed briefly the new orbiting mechanic. There are various objects and weapon platforms and units that are not going to be just in a static location in a planet, but they will orbit either around the planet's gravity well itself or around some other object. There's a new Guardian and a new Guard Post to take advantage of the corrosive weapon type. There are two new major defensive structures that AI can build on their plants. We've talked about the Brutal Guardian layers briefly before, and there is also an inertial missile battery. On the player side, there's more assets for you to acquire as well. Four new types of frigates. Five new types of strike craft. Destroyers are an entirely new ship class. There's ten different variants of those and they're probably most similar in power to the cruisers of the currently existing ships, but they work a little bit differently. Each one has their own unique ward, and a ward is simply a unit that orbits a ship and provides some sort of benefit firing at the enemy, shields, whatever that may be. And there are also additional wards that you can get from either ARS or FRS to put, for example, on your transports. Nine additional ones there for a total of 19 wards that you can acquire. Another way of spicing up the end game is the enhanced overlords option. That means in your final battle with the AI overlord, it will spawn wormhole invasions and exogalactic attacks and cause even more violence than they normally do. There are three additional map types, two additional quick starts at the time of this recording, and they are planning on adding more by the time launch date arrives. All in all, more toys for the player, more toys for the AI, New configuration options, a couple new types of ships, of course all of the new factions. I will be covering the other aspects more specifically in later videos, but with no further ado, let's get to the Necromancer. Playing as a Necromancer Empire is radically different from anything that's come before in AI War 2. It's much more about aggressive, dynamic, constant fleet action, as opposed to the tower defense angle, although that is still present. Imagine playing as Nanocost, or another faction that's heavily focused on zombification. You're really feeding off your enemies. That's the key theme of necromancy. And that extends to the economy. So if we look at the top line here of our resources, metal and energy are completely gone. They just flat out don't exist anymore. We still have science and hacking. Those do what they have traditionally done effectively. And then essence is present as well. That's a new resource we're going to be using for upgrades. But these resources are not replenished by expanding our territory in the galaxy. They're replenished by fighting and defeating specific enemies. Again, literally feeding off your opponent. So without energy, how do we determine the limits on what we can build? Well, first of all, for our structures, we've got this core group down here. 
and we have the hexes concept. They're essentially building slots. So you have a limited number of hexes or building slots per planet. And then we can see we've got shipyard. These are a few structures that are gonna give us more ships or a greater variety of ships. Defensive structures down here. They've each got their limitations, how many you can build and the hexes they consume on a particular planet. And there are going to be more structures later on, higher number of hexes as we upgrade. This is just a representative example of what you're gonna start off the game with. Let's take a look at a couple of these structures just to get a bit of a taste. So if we unpause here, this is a catapult. Catapults, notice they're orbiting the planet. The orbiting mechanic is really heavily emphasized in this expansion. And they increase their damage by range. And so I put this one on the edge of the planet so that it's typically going to be a long ways away from whatever is coming in here and trying to fight our core. And speaking of that core, we have a protective totem. And totems essentially generally will have orbiting whatever is going around them while towers are their own specific unit. So these have orbs of absorption and we can see it's got an attracted field and it's hardened. And so anything that comes in here, it's not super long range, but anything that comes into this core trying to knock out our key structures, it's gonna have to knock out these orbs of absorption pretty much first. Then let's take a look at our fleet because they're gonna work differently as well. So, we can upgrade our flagships with Essence, but notice we have bodyguards. Bodyguards are really a core of ships that you're always going to have available. They can be built conventionally. But the majority, the lion's share of your ships are not going to happen that way. They're going to happen by defeating the enemy. So skeletons, for example, you get more skeletons by defeating enemy strike craft. You get more whites by defeating enemy guardians and doing a sufficient amount of necromancy damage. So, given that, let's take a look at moving this out then into a neighboring system and seeing, okay, how's all this going to work out for us? And in here, we can see some other fun that we're going to get to deal with. We have Templar. This is a Templar encampment, and Templar only exists in Necromancer games. But you can see if we destroy this basic Templar structure, we get 500 hacking, or rather 500 science and 50 hacking. So that's part of how we are going to get our additional resources. Just this little squire here even is gonna be worth three science to us. But look at our numbers here. We've got 100 ships in this fleet. And let's head on over here and bug this guard post and do some combat here, and let's just see what happens to that number. Notice we're taking over that guard post, by the way. It now belongs to us, at least temporarily. So we're really able to conquer and turn things to our power. And now we're up to 135 ships. Where'd that extra 35 come from? Well, we're up to additional skeletons, and notice that we have, this is one of the structures we had in our home planet. Skeleton rogues, we've added a couple of those because occasionally when we get a new skeleton, it becomes this rogue. And we're going to be have, having many different types of variants. Rogue is just one, it's an example, but also higher number of base skeletons. We don't have any higher number of whites because we didn't fight any guardians. So depending on what you fight, you will increase in different ways and also depending on the buildings and upgrades you get. Now the other faction that automatically comes along for Necromancer, although you can use it in standard Human Empire games as well, is the Elderling. And these Feeble Elderlings are good ones to harvest. Notice that if we kill this one, it gets 25 Essence. If they mark up higher, they're worth more Essence. So sometimes you might want to avoid hitting them. But it's the basic idea that, you know, you could hit the Elderlings later for additional resource boost, and you're going to get Essence from Elderlings, and you're going to get Hacking and Science from Fighting Templar. And then you gradually just scale up what you're doing in that way. Now, eventually, we are going to want to conquer more territory. And this works very similarly to what we have seen in the past. We're simply, in a moment here, going to knock out this command station. There we go. And then we can build Acropolis. Now, there are three different types. 
we've got the defensive. That's the cheapest. Notice these are all costing us essence. So we're actually spending resources to expand, not getting them. But the defensive necropolis are going to give us vision on nearby planets. And they're going to give us more ability to build defensive structures. Really good for choke points, that type of position in the galaxy. But most of your necropolises are probably not going to be defensive. Major necropolises, and you can only get one of these for every so many planets you control in the galaxy. So you can't just spam them everywhere. But they give you additional flagships. So if I build one of these here, I would have a second flagship right away. What we're actually going to do in this case is build a miner. And they're in between on price. You don't get a fleet and you don't get the extra defensive boost. But what you do get is the ability to bolster or improve the capabilities of an existing flagship. So in this particular case, we only have one flagship. So we'll go to this one. But with multiple flagships later on, you can switch which fleet that your minor necropolis is going to improve. Anything we build here, like the skeleton rogue structure or the Possessed Whites. That's going to enhance then the abilities of our primary fleet here. And it will even become larger and larger and more powerful. Then we have this Templar Rift here. This is one of the major structures that we're going to want to be hacking throughout the game. And if we just take a look here, we can unlock Spectres or Gas or Doggers. Or we can get Skeleton Warriors, another Skeleton variant, Ravenous Whites, another White variant, etc. So, as you move out, you're going to be looking for Rifts to hack them. And if we move further out into the galaxy then, we can see we've got the normal AI stuff. They control the various planets, and then we've got an Ion Cannon and a Black Hole Machine here. And we'll go out and find the same items we might normally find. There's Data Centers, Raid Engine, all of those normal components to the galaxy. But then we can also go out and find things like white amplifier. So this is going to improve our white force for whatever particular fleet that that happens to be bolstering. Also, we have modules. So both your necropolises, the phylactery is basically your home necropolis. They can get enhanced with all these various choices. And notice if we upgrade them, they can have different options because these are only available at Mark II, Mark III, Mark V, etc. Also, your flagships get modules, and you can upgrade them in that sense as well. Now let's take a look at a more mature Necromancer Empire and some additional aspects that are going to come along with that. We have a few planets under our belt at this stage. Looking at the tech screen here, it's more simplified and streamlined than a standard human empire, which has a dizzying array of ships, and when you upgrade your weapons and hull types, you're really looking at batch upgrades, a bunch of different ship lines and turret lines all being upgraded at the same time. How can you get the most bang for your buck? Well, here, the ships are just divided into their each individual category. So you can upgrade just mummies, or just whites, or just skeleton rogues, or however you want to do that, or you can spread it across the ship types you have. Now, you only start out with a handful. You're going to get more ship types as the game progresses, but you have that specific targeting and it really allows you to adapt quite easily I think to different types of factions or different AI types that might emphasize one type of opposition and you can sort of go after combating that. The defenses are still divided into a couple of different batch categories though tower defenses and totems encapsulating all of those. Then if we look at our fleet let's take a look at some of what happens as it begins to approach its practical limit on how strong it can get. Weak skeletons are created when you reach your cap of skeletons, as the description is telling us there. They're weak because, well, they're not very strong, and because they attrition quickly, and so they will not stick around. And so you're never going to have an absolutely massive amount of these. But if we take a look at, for example, the skeleton rogue, those will eventually decay into regular skeletons. Possessed whites will eventually decay into regular whites. So that's going to happen with the variants that we're going to acquire. And so what we're going to have going on is a real emphasis continuing on successfully being in regular combat. Because if you're out of combat, well, your weak skeletons are just going to attrition. If you're going into a fight that's too much for you, then you're going to be losing a bunch of ships. It takes you a while to build all of that back up. 
But if you're regularly doing combat where you're winning, taking out as many enemies as you can but winning, then you're really keeping your fleet up towards its maximum potential. And that's going to be a core gameplay loop for playing Necromancer. Then we have built our first defensive necropolis. If we take a look at our build list here, notice there are no ship enhancing structures. But there are additional defensive structures that you don't get if it's not a defensive necropolis. So we'd really be able to fortify and concentrate defenses much more effectively on this type of a planet. Let's say we decided that we didn't want this here though. You can't transform them like you can in a human empire between logistics, economic, military, but you can just flat out move them, which I think is a really interesting mechanic that people have had some fun with. I'm curious what type of strategies players will come up with around this. So if we go to hacking, we can just move it, exchange it with, say, the minor necropolis here on Vixie. So we're going to put a defensive necropolis there. Now notice all of our supporting structures are now gone. You don't want to do this to try to get yourself out of immediate trouble. It's more of a planned strategic thing where you're giving yourself a little bit of time at least to rebuild everything that you're going to want around it. But we've got a minor necropolis here. And now if we look at Vixie, well, that now has a defensive necropolis. And so we can rebuild around here. Now I've also built up a major necropolis here, my second one, and that's given me the second defensive fleet. As the attacks continue to scale up from the AI, and we also get periodic attacks from the Templar as well, it can be quite useful, given the Necromancer's limited defenses, to have a fleet that will just move around and put out fires, while your primary fleet, that we're probably up to seeing more of our firepower on, they can move out and attack into enemy territory. There is more yet to be seen as well from our two other factions, the Elderlings and the Templar. We're going to start out with the Elderlings. And the Transform Elderling hack here. So, these will transform the Elderling into a more powerful form. But defeat that and you get a Necromancer blueprint. What that is used for is to transform one of your flagships into a more powerful form. And each type of Elderling is going to give you a different type a blueprint so that's a lot of fun to play around with and also boost up the firepower of your flagships but it is a fairly significant resource investment because you've got the transform hack here you've got a more expensive transform hack to do on your flagship after you get the blueprint plus you've got to defeat this other elderling that's going to be created so investment but you get a really cool reward for it out of the other end then the elderling territory tracking each Elderling will roam not just randomly throughout the entire galaxy, but has a specific group of systems that it's going to go around and patrol. And so we can track it. There are a number of purposes for this. We might want to let it mark up and hit it later. We might want to know where it is. So if it's a couple systems away from a place we're going to attack, we know it's not going to interfere there if we go attack there now. Then there's Summon Transcendent Elderling. Very expensive hack, but if you need to get essence and you're far enough in the game where you can really roam around the galaxy quite a bit this can really help you do that basically trading hacking for essence as you're going to summon a very strong elderling but somewhere else in the galaxy you don't know where but if you're able to hunt it down then you can get a big reward of essence from that then let's take a look at something else which is the lure elderlings hack so this will just basically attract it's like bait to pull the elderlings in maybe they're in a location you want to knock out this elderling but it's too hard to handle where it is it's on a highly fortified planet or maybe you just want to pull the elderling away from a planet that you want to attack and it's hanging around too close to it that could be a potential use for this as well then the templar we can see here this is a Next tier up from the encampment we already saw, a fastness fortification. And we can see the reward there, 500 science and 7 hacking. And we can take these and significant hacking costs, but you can corrupt Templar defenses and sort of turn them to your side as opposed to getting that resource reward from them, if you wish. Then if we move further and further out in the galaxy, they will have higher level items, such as the castle. Stepping up again from the fastness. And 
they get a reward as well. Also, they have constructors that are going to move around the galaxy, and they're going to be building additional Templar fortifications. So it's not just that we're moving throughout a static galaxy and eliminating the resistance, but the Templar also have their own activities in mind. It's definitely highly encouraged to knock out these constructors, and you're given a big reward there, as you can see, a thousand science, 25 hacking, to encourage you to go after them and to do that. Then, finally, when we get to the AI homeworld, well, the Templar are going to be there waiting for us as well. Notice the Templar Sovereign here. It's going to be surrounded by castles that you have to knock out before you can knock out the Sovereign. It's very comparable to the AI Overlord, where you have to knock out the Dire Guard post before hitting the Overlord. And essentially, what's going to happen here is it's just going to really make hitting the AI homeworlds that much more challenging. You really need to build up a fairly powerful force to do that. You also do get a reward down there, 2,500 science, 50 hacking. But it adds a Templar element to those homeworld assaults. And that is the short version of what the Necromancer Empire does and what the Nine Zul Abyss expansion contains. I hope this has been interesting to everybody. When we return, we are going to be getting into the other factions that are available with the expansion. And we'll get into the other features and details after that. Thanks for watching.